Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to this candidate webinar. I'm Kelly Testy, the president and CEO of the Law School Admission Council, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today and to thank you for joining us. This is a continuing challenging time for everyone as all of our hearts go out to everyone affected by this COVID crisis. And we wanna first of all, extend best wishes to you, uh, your family, your friends, and hope that everyone's staying as healthy and safe as possible during this time. I know this is a disruptive time. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is to try and share as much information we can with law school candidates so that we help you navigate the law school admission process during this time. And I'm really pleased that this is the third webinar we've been able to present. And I have today a wonderful group of panelists that have joined me so that we can together share information about best practices and how to navigate this time. And to give you also some key updates on LSAT Flex, which we announced uh, about a week ago that will be available in May. So I wanna first recognize our panelists and thank them for joining us. And then I want to let you know after that how we'll proceed with the webinar today so that you can get the questions you have answered and get some support and help along the enrollment journey you're taking for law school. Because we sure want you to stay on that journey. We need you now more than ever, and our world really needs a lot more justice than we see now. So let me welcome our panelists today. I want to first say a very warm welcome to Dean Gary Jenkins, who joins us from the University of Minnesota School of Law. Gary, thanks for being here. Ah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I also welcome Alicia Kramer, who is the Assistant Dean at uh, South Texas College of Law. And Alicia, we're thrilled you can be with us today, too. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I also welcome Matthew Lee, who is currently the Assistant Dean at the University of Texas Law School at Austin. Matthew, it's good to see you again after having worked together earlier in our careers, and I welcome you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And I'm very pleased to welcome with that beautiful uh, background there in Miami, uh, Katrin Stroll, who's uh, the Assistant Dean for Admission and Enrollment at Miami. So, Katrin, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, I want to uh, let everyone know today that what we're going to do in terms of process is that I want to begin with a few updates about LSAT Flex, uh, because we know that there's a number of questions that you all have about that. And so I'm going to begin with that and uh, provide some of those updates. And then I have a number of uh, questions that I want to pose to the panelists, because we know that really uh, there's so many people uh, on the webinar today. And some of you are on to learn about LSAT Flex, and others are, of you are on to learn about the enrollment process more generally. And so what I want to do is start with some key updates about LSAT Flex for those of you who didn't get all the questions answered last week that you had. And then we'll move to uh, having hearing from the panel about several key issues in enrollment. And then we'll move on to taking your questions. And so please know that you're welcome to send in uh, on the Q&A feature of the webinar your questions. We'll answer some of them here today. And then any that we don't get to, uh, the staff at LSAC is making sure that they get back to you and they'll answer the questions that you have. I also want to remind our viewers that at LSAC.org, we also have a wealth of resources there about the admission process itself but also specific facts and questions uh, about the LSAT Flex. So that will supplement then what, uh, what we're able to share with you today. So let me begin by saying that um, I know that one of the biggest questions is when the test will be offered. We announced uh, eight days ago, although it seems longer, that we would provide LSAT Flex in the second half of May and that we would announce the actual test dates no later than this Friday. Well, I'm happy to let you know that we've been working hard to get those set because we know the sooner we have those out, you can begin to plan. So I wanna let uh, you know that we have those dates for you today and thank you for your patience and flexibility as we work through those. I also wanna thank all of my staff who've been working so hard to move this forward at warp speed. So the dates that we will be offering for you to take LSAT Flex are 
primarily May 18th and May 19th. So May 18th and May 19th, that's a Monday and Tuesday. And those are the primary test dates. I say primary because as you all know, LSAT is deeply committed to disability accommodations. And as we work with the accommodations that, uh, that various individuals require, it could extend beyond that just a little bit as we make sure that we meet all those required accommodations. But uh, I do want to let you know that we understand how important it is for everyone to get their score at the same time. And so one of the things there is I want to let you know that regardless of the exact day that you take LSAT Flex, we will make sure the scoring is done on the, by the same date. And we are targeting doing that no later, the scores coming out no later than Friday, June 5th. And so that that would be plenty of time for those of you who are wanting to apply for fall of 2020, this fall, that will be plenty of time to be able to do that. Now, as we uh, have announced the time frame, the May 18th and 19th, we know that may affect your decisions one way or the other about what you want to do in terms of your own test date. So we have extended the deadline for April registrants to tell us if they want to take the May test or not. And we're extending that deadline two more days. So the new deadline is now 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time this Friday, April 17th. So you have until uh, this Friday, close to midnight, uh, to be able to decide whether you'd like to go ahead and register for May. Now, if you don't submit a form uh, at that time, then you'll automatically be registered uh, for the May test. And so we strongly, though, encourage everyone to fill out their form. That's going to give us a lot better idea of exactly how many of you would like to sit for May uh, LSAT Flex. And that really helps because, as you can imagine, with uh, thousands of test takers, we have a lot of remote proctoring um, logistics to work through. And anything we can do to streamline that process for you and for us that will help that go a lot smoother. So please fill out that form uh, at your candidate site at lsac.org. And uh, I would uh, encourage you to do that so we can help you at this unprecedented time in legal education to make sure that your enrollment journey continues successfully. And we're really looking forward to uh, being able to work with you on this. And uh, thank you very much again, as in this uh, big challenging time, we've been able to come forward to offer this so that your enrollment journey can continue. Now, before I turn to our panelists today, I want to uh, uh, answer two or three other questions that have been common ones about LSAT Flex. And in doing that, I also wanna let you know that we put a top 10 questions about LSAT Flex out on our blogs and on our website. And so if the particular question that I, uh, that I treat here isn't the one you had, please check those because it may be well answered there. And if it's not, just get in touch with us and we'll make sure you get your questions answered. So the first question, and I'm gonna invite our panel to respond to this later as well, is just whether law schools will accept the LSAT Flex as a valid part of the law school admission process? And the answer is yes to that. Uh, every school, of course, has its own process for admission and, the, and its own way that it decides to weight tests, GPAs, work experience, leadership experience, all the various factors in the holistic review that schools do. But our schools are very excited that this tool is available and uh, delighted that it can help you complete your enrollment journey. So I think you should know that because it is the same quality that LSAT uh, is known for, the same kind of questions, then it is valid, reliable, and will be treated like that by our schools. So I think uh, that should help you understand that uh, this is a wonderful option for you right now. And uh, again, we're pleased to be able to support you by bringing it forward at this unprecedented time. The other question we've had from a lot of you, of course, is how should I prepare for the LSAT Flex? Um, and uh, you know, how are you going to count the various sections? And in particular, there's been questions about how we would count the logical reasoning section, uh, section on the LSAT Flex. So let me uh, uh, address that and let you know that uh, 
despite rumors to the contrary, we're not double counting logical reasoning on the LSAT flex. There are three sections, analytical reasoning, logical reasoning, and reading comprehension. And it's the same question types that you've been used to studying for and that are on the LSAT. And the LSAT flex includes roughly the same number of each of those question types. So if you find one type of question more challenging than others, you may want to focus your preparation on that. But each of those question types will uh, be on the test and one is not weighted more heavily than the other. And so your uh, preparation should be for all three and obviously for the ones that you might find more challenging than others, put in more time on those. Um, I also have had questions about whether we would be making the logical reasoning section harder on this LSAT flex. And the answer to that is no. That speculation that we would uh, be trying to make this section more difficult and different than prior tests on which you've practiced or been used to is not accurate. All sections of the LSAT flex, including the logical reasoning section, will be composed of LSAT questions that have been extensively tested and analyzed through our same rigorous process of item development and section development process. Uh, so it is not designed to be harder or easier than a typical LSAT. So you can expect uh, that same uh, quality uh, on this test. So I want to let you know that, again, there are more questions that we have on our website. And then as we get to the portion of the um, uh, program today, when you're able to ans uh, write in questions and we address some of those, we can also uh, hit some others as we have time to do that. I hope those help you, though. Those seem to be the ones that you were, you were most interested in when we did our, our, last, uh, our last webinar. <coughs> So let me uh, now again re-welcome our panel and uh, I wanna turn to the panel and get them involved in our conversation today. And I think what I would like to start with is that um, all the candidates panelists are of course, you know, trying to prepare during a time that has some unique challenges to it. And so hearing from you who are out there in the schools and working in admission and leading the law school that can really help the candidates know what are you expecting now and what do you advise, what are you seeing? So, um, Katrin, I think I'll start with you on this one and if you could share uh, from your perspective at Miami what you're advising right now and what you're seeing in the field. Absolutely. Um, I think we're all trying to support our students during this unprecedented times. We want to be as innovative and supportive and accommodating uh, to students who want to go to law school this year, next year, and beyond. So I think that uh, I speak for the admissions community in that we all are doing our best to be available and, um, like I said, flexible enough that we navigate the process. And I think that LSAC Flex is exactly the alternative that we were waiting for in terms of making sure that students um, have an option to take the LSAT for enrollment in 2020. The LSAT, whether it's flex or standard, is the only exam designed specifically for law schools that is accepted at all law schools. So if a student is uh, planning to enroll in, or wants to enroll in, law, in a law school in 2020, my advice is to take it. Um, and for a student who wants to enroll in 2021, why not take it and get the score under your belt? And then if you don't like it, hopefully you'll have another time to take it in the future. Uh, but if you don't, then you have it, and then you have something to work with. At the end of the day, the LSAT is one of the tools at, that as admissions officers we have to evaluate the can candidate's ability to succeed in law school. We all, you know, most law schools have a holistic approach and look at many other things in the file as well. So this is just one of the tools that we'll continue to assess. And the LSAT Flex provides us just one more tool as part of the process. So I have been encouraging applicants that I've talked to in the last week to take it, there's nothing to lose. Just go ahead and take it and give us another tool that will allow us to assess their file uh, for consideration this year or next year. Thank you, Katrin. Very helpful and great reminder that you know some people are applying for this fall and others are starting to think about the cycle for the following fall. And so uh, that can help both of those groups. 
Uh, Dean Jenkins, let me turn to you uh, and uh, thank you for your leadership in Legal Ed. I'm sure you have a lot going on as you're uh, turning your whole school into online education. Uh, let, let us know uh, what you're advising for candidates right now. Sure. Uh, well, indeed, it is a, a busy time and a tumultuous time in many ways, but our watchwords are normality and flexibility. And I think that uh, that's very much uh, the case with respect to what I'm advising around the LSAT flex. Um, and, and that is, um, you know, we're just like we view the original, uh, we are thinking of this new test as one component of the entire application process. And, um, and, and we believe in holistic admissions, as most law schools in the country do. And we're looking at a, a complete file, and this is one piece of evidence. And uh, as far as we're concerned, we're going to treat uh, this test like any other test. So, um, um, so we are also advising and encouraging students to uh, continue along their journey, along the timeline that makes sense for them. And if students are ready to take the test, then absolutely um, uh, they should go ahead and take the test now. Um, and we are going to treat uh, the LSAT flex score, I think this, the exact same way that we would treat the original LSAT score. Um, and that's gonna be good, to be honest, not just for this season or even next season, but uh, for the years after that. Um, right now, it's currently, um, you know, a, the scores are, are good for a period of time and we're gonna treat this um, uh, the same way. Thank you so much, Dean Jenkins. I appreciate that. And uh, Alicia, let me move over to you and, uh, and get your uh, advice for the candidates, whether they're applying this fall or for the future. Absolutely. Um, you know, people have been calling in very nervous because this is so unique and different and scary to some people. Um, but I think I just want to um, convey, you know, to, to candidates that you know, the LSAT is a valid and, and uh, very useful tool for law schools, and it's a tool. It's not the only thing that we're going to consider, um, but I have every confidence in um, LSAC um, and their strict, uh, the way they, they run their uh, psychometricians and the way that you put things together, um, I have no concern at all that this test will be any, um, any less favorable or valid or um, uh, safe um, for everybody. And so I have been encouraging, as Katrin uh, mentioned, you know, candidates that are calling to please consider if you are prepared in March and April to take an LSAT and you are ready to go, there is no reason to be concerned or worried because it's changing a little bit. Um, I'm just grateful that it's gonna be available um, to applicants so that we can be able and to move forward and help them move forward in their journey. So I would just encourage people to not be, I know it's different and change is scary and we've got a lot of that going on right now, but there should be no concern about um, how the law school is going to use it because we consider it as valid as any other LSAT administration. Alicia, I appreciate that. And you reminded me of an important point because one of the things that helped us a lot with this is that we had already been leaning into uh, working in the digital environment. As everyone knows, you know, we went digital. That helped us you know, move into that mode in a valid and reliable way. And we also have the LSAT writing that started as remote proctoring you know, earlier this year. So I think the candidates will find, you know, given preparation on the Khan Academy that's, you know, online and free, a wonderful resource, given preparation that they've done on our site where they familiarize themselves with the LSAT through that site. Um, and also just, uh, you know, the, the fact that it is the same items, the same question types, I think they'll find it much you know, very similar experience that uh, I know when you first hear something new, you, you wonder, but I agree with your point. And um, I've also, you know, and since coming to LSAC, really learned too that the, the whole industry of psychometricians are enormously careful people. Um, they, they might even go to one side of lawyers in that, in that sense. So they make sure everything's in, uh, in good order. Matthew, I want to come to you, and um, and uh, you know you're you're also in the great state of Texas, and uh, 
had so much experience in, uh, in legal education. And uh, so I'd really like to add your voice to this now about what you think candidates should be addressing and thinking about during this time. Yeah, so you know, I just want to underscore some of the comments that my colleagues have made. And one in particular is that we trust LSAC to create a product that is nothing less than the gold standard. So you know, if there are any concerns on the prospective students' side that the LSAT Flex is anything less than a valid and reliable test so that admissions officers can make an informed decision about their candidacy into the law school, I just want to assuage any concerns that that's going to be the case. Uh, we have every confidence in LSAC to really, again, deliver a product that will help us do our work. And then the other thing is that all of this really is in the best interest of the students. Uh, Kelly, I remember you know, working with you and uh, you have a sign, and I hope you still have a sign on your desk that says, how does this serve the students, right? And so as you know, my colleagues have said, this additional uh, opportunity is just, again, in the best interest of the students so that they can continue to pursue legal education to do the important work that really needs to be done in our communities. And so, you know, just, uh, you know, how this is all going to impact us, I mean, to me, it's very exciting, right? I'm, I'm a huge proponent of change and innovation, and to me, this just allows us, uh, again, an additional tool to uh, evaluate candidates. So, you know, I, I'm very excited about the LSAT Flex. Great. Well, thank you all for your comments on that. I, I appreciate it. And it's certainly us working together with all of you. We have this, you know, on our legal our ecosystem in legal education. And I want to remind the candidates too that you know you have wonderful examples here in three admission deans and a dean of the wonderful personnel in our schools. And so make sure you remember too that as much as LSAC.org is a good source for information, the schools are outstanding sources. And you know, go, you know, talk to the admissions offices, get in touch with the school if you have specific questions because they're there to serve and they're just a, a great group eager to do that. Um, I want to tackle one other issue panel and, and uh, I think all of us have been not only so saddened by the COVID crisis itself but also the differential impact it's had on, on different communities. And in this huge rush that everyone had to make to online education that raised questions for equity, you know, in terms of, you know, who has access to the right equipment or spaces to, to be doing online or remote learning. Now, one of the things we've done, and I want to make sure candidates know, is to address that, is that if any of you feel that you don't have the equipment or space you need to, to take the LSAT Flex, we want you to get in touch with us because we want to help you with that and we think we can help you with that. Um, but I wanna ask our panel for any comment on that issue too, because it may be that some of your schools are doing some things um, or just advice you have for candidates who um, may find themselves right now in a less than ideal space. Um, so let me open that up and just maybe signal with a hand wave if any of you'd like to tackle that one. And uh, I'll be glad to, to add you know, to hear your comments on any aspect of that that you'd like to make. Alicia, you're not, you're not raising your hand, but <laughs> I'm smiling. I, I'm gonna, you're smiling. So I'm going to start with you. Well, you know, I think the thing that I was encouraged by um, when I was reading the, the memo was that, you know, you guys are going to help students that have found themselves in a you know a particularly um, difficult situation because we all know um, you know it, it was interesting when my school went uh, you know remote learning I hadn't even considered which was silly on my part that there would be my students that didn't have laptops um, and they we were having to you know really reach out and help them and it, it really opened my eyes it reminded me you know and everybody and everyone has an iPad or a laptop or a desktop at home. And so then, you know, when you move to this situation with, you know, LSAT Flex, it was very um, comforting, I guess, to know that you guys will be doing the absolute best you can to work with those students who are, you know, again, in a less fortunate position and they don't have the equipment or the place and space um, that they might need because we want everybody to be able to take advantage of this test 
and perform you know, to the best of their ability. And so I guess, you know, I would encourage, as you just did, anybody that's finding themselves in a difficult situation and they need assistance, they really shouldn't even consider, a, give it a second thought, you know, to be able to reach out and get the accommodations or the, um, the, uh, the, the, the things that they need to be able to take advantage of this, just like everybody else. Good, good, very good. Excellent. I see a number of, of uh, questions popping through and I'll, I'll take this one before I turn back to the panel to hear about your advice for uh, navigating as this crisis, you know, if it were to continue over the summer with these restrictions on travel and, and, and if the schools were even to stay remote in the fall, you know, how should the students be thinking about that? I want to come to that. Uh, before I do that, I, you know, obviously, anytime we're going to take a test, you know, at all, we worry about, oh my gosh, what if my machine picks that very day to crash? Or what if there's, you know, something that happens? And I do want to let uh, the candidates know that the technology, you know, is, is very reliable. And, uh, and one of the things that we do see is that we study, you know, the number of times that there is some kind of a technology problem. Now those are inevitable. Anything we do with technology in the world is always going to, there's always going to be those times, right? But I think that the way that I would hope candidates would think about that and understand is that if something were to happen as you were taking it, if you were to have a power outage or your computer trouble or something like that, we will work with you. It's not going to be like we just say, oh, well then too bad, right? Um, we will be in touch with all of you. And, uh, and so, you know, don't let that impede you, you know, know that, um, you know, you can prepare as best you can. And the, the, you know, we made sure that this system is accessible from a wide variety of devices, you know, Windows and Mac and making sure that it's a, you know, a lot of, it's easier to access. But just know that if something were to happen during the administration of yours, we'll work with you on that. Don't, you know, don't let that stop you from your, your enrollment journey. We'll make sure we're there and, and work that through. And that's, you know, really in some ways, remember to no different than any time you sat down to do something. You know, a law school exam, same thing. Many law school exams today are taken through, uh, you know, software. And so that's something you'll do in law school as well. Um, the, uh, the, uh, so the other question panelists, and, I, and uh, I think this time, Matthew, I'll start with you, is just, what are you foreseeing about summer and fall, uh, you know, at your institution? And what advice do you have for candidates in navigating through these times? Yeah, most institutions were paying very close attention and monitoring uh, the situation uh, daily. Uh, we're having conversations uh, to think about contingency plans. Uh, it's our hope and we're very optimistic that we still can have uh, in-person classes in the fall and that's the, you know, the starting point and that's uh, where we're you know, really working from. But at the same time, you know, we're having these conversations just to make sure that in the event that this extends a little bit longer than we hope, that we have a smooth transition and I think over the last several weeks, in sort of the abruptness of having to transition to a work from home environment, uh, that has allowed us to learn a lot of lessons that will be informative as we kind of move into the summer and into the fall. I think, you know, for most institutions, you know, having summer classes um, was something that we traditionally haven't had at Texas Law, uh, just because, you know, our students were doing internships and we're employed and which is a great thing for the institution and so we really hadn't thought about you know creating you know summer courses and so now this uh, law school's leadership is really thinking you know what can we do you know to serve our students in sort of this interim period um, you know for me if this were to extend into the fall um, you know it's going to impact our recruitment efforts and how we traditionally have recruited students when you think about the work of admissions, there are three major stages, right? There's sort of the recruitment of students, uh, then there's the admissions part where we're evaluating the candidates. And then, you know, in the stage that we're at right now, which is, you know, the yield stage where all of the students we've admitted, you know, we want them to now enroll. And I think, you know, in the fall, which traditionally schools would go to different law fairs and different undergraduate institutions to wave a law school's banner and to talk and, and to meet with candidates, I think that's going to change. You know, I think uh, 
um, you know, a lot of these conversations that we're having in terms of, you know, what that's going to look like, I suspect that there's going to be increased number of virtual events. It's something that we've done in the past. Uh, but I think you're going to see a lot more virtual events and uh, law days that are going to be, you know, uh, held on Zoom. Um, I think how we serve our current, uh, how we serve our students who are looking to, you know, meet with uh, an admissions representative, we're going to have to, you know, translate that into an online format. I think the least disruptive uh, in our process is going to be sort of the evaluation period because obviously we do that you know, through LSAC and through ACES and we're not going to see you know, a, a large impact in that. Um, most of our committee members are reviewing files online already and so that's the least of our concern. And then you know, kind of what we've had to experience this year in the last couple of weeks uh, with transitioning you know, in-person admitted students events into an online format, I think that will continue on, but hopefully, you know, this will not extend beyond the fall. That's our hope. Good, Matthew, and uh, certainly ours too. I know uh, it's one of the things that is difficult about this time is it's very hard to know what will we see in a month, what will we see, you know, in two months, and uh, because I think two months ago, none of us would have predicted we're here, right? So, being able to stay nimble and keep communicating is so important. Katrin, let me move to you and uh, what are you thinking about uh, you know from your standpoint for this summer and fall and this cycle that Matthew noted? So this a lot of the same in terms of what Matthew mentioned about what is happening in terms of moving our entire process accessible in a more remote way. So whether it, at Miami you know you can actually just make an appointment on my calendar on Calendly if you want and uh, you will get me. I mean I have appointments today until 9 30 p.m. So I think that we are doing on our end uh, the best that we can to be even more available than usual just to curve the students. And that, I think, is going to be the standard for the summer and into the fall, that we just find that we have to answer more questions, whether it's in a virtual setting or on the phone, and, and we're doing our best to keep up. I think that for the students, my advice would be to be proactive. We're here to help and in, in any medium. You want Zoom, you want GoToMeeting, you want Hangout, we don't care, we will help you. And I do think that that's, the students, especially students, and this kind of goes back also to the previous question um, about students that are, you know, facing extreme situations that, uh, that you know, it's just not, it's, there's nothing we can do about it in terms, they don't tell us. So help us help you navigate in terms of what you were talking about, you know, with there's issues in terms of reliable internet to be able to take the test. The schools in your local area may actually have a room that they can help you with. We're not there. So there may be uh, spaces that we can find for you to be able to take these exams. So reach out to your local schools. Um, certainly reach out to LSAC. We all connect very well with LSAC so that we can pull our resources too. But I think being a proactive student in this situation is very important. If you, have an, if you have a question, ask. If you need something, need some kind of flexibility, you know, we're people, we understand. We're also all going through this together. And if you reach out, you know, nine times out of 10, we will have a solution for you. Um, the other piece in terms of going into the fall, I think students need to be mindful, um, especially when it comes to letters of recommendation and some of the documentation gathering in terms of transcripts, everything is taking longer. And students need to be patient uh, in the process. And I do think that they also need to be proactive in, to that extent. Recommenders are going to maybe have a harder time coming up with being able to do the letters and being able to send them in in time and being able to send them correctly in the right format because they're also working remotely. So being proactive and gathering the documentation, especially now that everyone's remote, I think it's very, very important. Um, we're all putting our best foot forward virtually, and I think that we, if you're interested in a school, we are, email us, ask about our information sessions coming up, ask about our process changes, open house, we're available and ready to answer questions. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, that advice you have about the students really reaching out and being proactive, I have to say that's the same kind of uh, advice that's going to help them in law school too and even beyond. So that too is, a, is good skills training for what it takes to thrive in law school and, and beyond. 
Um, I want to turn to Dean Jenkins and, and ask his thought on, on what his, he's expecting for fall and just advice he has for candidates. But before that, I do that, I want to note, I think we have some people who may have signed on a little late and just want to note that we have announced the May 18th and 19th dates for the LSAT Flex. Uh, the other question that's coming in again is, are you, are you going to count that logical reasoning double or something? And I want to again say, no, we have three sections. We're counting them all as, their, as the same, uh, sex, same weight and uh, each question. Uh, so, you know, please treat each question as, uh, as its own question and we're not double counting anything. Um, and those are the typical questions that you've been practicing, that you've been preparing for, and uh, that, you, that you can expect. So, Dean Jenkins, uh, from your perspective, what are you expecting for fall? And, and I'd also really be grateful if you would address just for a general uh, audience who are wondering, should I go to law school at all? What are your thoughts about why might be, now might be a, a good time uh, to pursue legal education? Sure. Well, you know, as we all know, you know, there's no crystal ball right now, and um, and it's just not possible to um, predict with certainly any confidence the trajectory of this pandemic uh, and what the future is going to look like. So I think that we're all in a process right now where we're doing a lot of contingency planning, and we're, uh, you know, I think part of that. Uh, of course, at the beginning, it was all about let's let's deal with what's immediately in front of us, which was getting through the semester, uh, and which for most of us included a uh, for, certainly for those on a semester, those of us who are on semesters, um, was a major transition in the middle of the semester uh, and adjusting for that. And now, I think for most institutions, it's about moving to summer and planning for the summer, and then looking out to the fall. Um, you know, I think that many of us are optimistic that over the next, um, you know, as many of us are in states that are still under shelter in place through at least, you know, early May, mid-May, that there'll be some reevaluation, um, you know, over the course of the month of May into early June about fall. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that contingency planning isn't starting. And we're all beginning to think about lots of different options, which um, of course may include a continuation of, of uh, uh, remote or virtual instruction, um, but there are also lots of uh, um, options in between. What if uh, there are uh, uh, the ability for us to gather, but we have to limit the number of uh, the size uh, in which we can gather? Um, you know, is that a possibility? And then how would we respond? So I think really right now, um, you know, most institutions are thinking through um, those options uh, and, and what they need. And if I were a law student, um, you know, I would be thinking about, um, uh, uh, about really just being flexible and responding to whatever creative measures um, the institutions are going to come up with. Um, what, what's not going to waver is our commitment to our mission. Um, and certainly, um, you know, we are committed to, to legal education, to making sure that uh, students have the opportunity to pursue their dreams of a legal education. And, you know, my colleagues uh, on this panel have already spoken uh, and given some great ideas um, about how we're going to do that, how we're going to respond uh, in creative ways. Both you know, Matthew and Katrin spoke about the arc of the admissions process um, and how those will adapt um, online. I think that um, it, it may lead to a more uh, bespoke uh, or a more custom, uh, I think, approach to recruitment. Um, I think if you think about those large fairs where we're often seeing lots of people talking to lots of folks, if we're not able to do that, there could be more opportunities for that kind of one-on-one, -on -one, go to the school, set up the appointments, um, and, and, and other great ideas. So I think there'll be uh, creativity, but still opportunities. And in some ways, um, it could be actually even more personalized but it's gonna also require effort on the students to connect with the various institutions um, uh, in, in ways to do that. And, and I think that that's uh, critically 
important and I hope that people will continue on in their journey because as you've indicated, Kelly, we need lawyers um, now, I think more than ever. I think that some of the inequalities that one of your prior questions um, raised just highlight the importance of uh, law and, and lawyers in the world. And, and this situation is no different. We have um, some of our faculty and students who are working closely with healthcare providers on uh, some complicated issues around um, ethical decision making and access to resources. Um, uh, and, and law plays an important role. You know, there's not an issue in society that is certainly one. There's not an issue that's important to society that doesn't have a legal dimension. And this is no different. And I think certainly in this crisis right now, and certainly coming out of it, there will be a range of legal needs. Um, if you think of everything from insurance to housing to um, employment, I mean, you name it, um, there are going to be substantial um, legal needs and, and we're going to continue to need to produce um, uh, well-qualified lawyers to help our society function and function well and serve uh, our communities and advance justice. So I think that, um, uh, again, those who are interested and committed, um, we'll, we, will, we need you now and we will need you in the future, I think, more than ever. Thank you, Gary. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, I do think we've seen through this crisis that, you know, having a strong infrastructure where we understand the relationship of federal power and state power and having that system be smooth so that, that a, a world and a nation, a state can respond to crisis. That's much of the work of lawyers. And there's so much I think that's out there to do to, to help us be um, creating a world where everyone can thrive and, and being resilient and able to respond when really hard things hit. So uh, certainly agree with you about the need for uh, lawyers today and, and also that need to stay nimble. And uh, Alicia, I want to turn to you in a minute and get your thoughts on, on the, the fall. And, uh, but before I do that, let me also share with our viewers that uh, you've asked whether are you going to stay nimble LSAC? Are you going to offer this more, more often? And I want to say, of course, we, we are. Um, our first priority was the people who were registered for March and April because they were already registered and couldn't test in the traditional way. So we're making sure that we get them taken care of, especially in case they want to apply for this fall. Um, we have a June 8th date out there and we will be monitoring to see whether we can do that. Uh, Dean Jenkins, as you said, it, if we can do it in the field, it might require different configurations, maybe smaller groups, and we'll be ready for that. If we need to keep offering LSAT Plex, we will certainly do that as well and announce different uh, and additional dates in, you know, in June and beyond if necessary for this. And that's, I think, something that I just want to make sure people know they can count on. Uh, I had a few questions come in as, can, can you just waive the test? And the ABA uh, isn't going to do that. That's something that, you know, we're committed to because it really does show, and uh, all research shows, it's a fair admissions process. Because otherwise, bias can creep in where you're putting too much weight on a GPA or where you went to school or who you know. And this helps even the playing field. And, it's also exactly the same skills that you need to thrive in law school. So it gives you, candidate, a fair measure of that. So you know before you make this investment if this fits for you, and it also helps your, your law school evaluate all candidates fairly. Um, Alicia, when I turn to you, one of the questions that also came up uh, that I might ask you to weave in is, is candidates were wondering how schools use the writing portion of the LSAT. And uh, so if you could give any update on what you see coming for fall and just your thoughts about how that writing is used, that would be awesome. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the values of how it's being administered now versus before when it was given at the time, you know, they took the, L the LSAT, it was, um, you know, under, you know, after the whole test was over, you're trying to, you know, your mind is probably going in a thousand different directions. You're either happy with how you did or not happy. And then you had to put this, you know, 
writing sample together. And so I find that now, since it's done, you know, not the same day as the test and someone can give it some thought, it's a little bit more valuable, I think, um, because it can at least be thoughtful. Um, people can give it, you know, as much consideration as they need and they can take it at a time that's um, more comfortable or favorable um, when they want to take it. So I find it's probably got a little more value, not that it, you know, was not valuable, um, but I think it's more meaningful now simply because it's it's done in a different fashion. So I think that's been um, very, very helpful. Very good, thank you. Uh, any other thoughts, uh, Katrin or Matthew, about the writing or any other uh, part that you'd like to share? Any different sense? Well, from an obvious perspective, now I can actually read it <laughs> because I don't have to figure out <laughs> the, the, the handwriting and that's definitely a big plus. Um, I think it's just, again, another tool to assess whether the, the student's readiness um, in terms of writing, such an important skill for law school. So it, it is a great tool. And now that I can actually read it, certainly even better. <laughs> I, I absolutely concur with my colleagues. I mean, the fact that we can read it just allows us to now use it. Um, and the faculty committee really has found it very useful for you know, all the reasons that, that has been mentioned. It, it just gives a much more substantive product for us to assess their uh, potential for the law school. So. Great. Kudos to you guys for making that happen. Yeah. Good. Well, it uh, you know writing is something so so vital, and uh, you know I was also th thinking about the fact that during this semester I've been teaching at Villanova a class on law and leadership to a group of three L's. So we had to rush to go online too when this all occurred. And I do want to say to the candidates out there that it's been fun for me and the students to have that almost in some ways almost a more personal relationship you know looking right at each other you know for the class and we've done a number of fun exercises where you know part of the leadership class they recorded a crisis communication speech so that was already something that was easy to do remotely so i do want to say to the students i think you'll find that these formats uh, you know as dean jenkins uh, noted you know may usher in some more creativity some things that will even improve the learning experience. Now, that's not to say that we don't all want to get back where we're all together a little bit more. We all do. But uh, it is a time when I think there are some silver linings, and, uh, and I hope we can all continue to find those. I want to ask each of our panelists for any closing comments that they have. It, the hour goes quickly, um, and so I want to start with Dean Jenkins and then go around for that, and then I'll have a few closing comments just to pertaining to some LSAC matters before we sign off today. I do want to let any viewers know who might need to sign off early that this is available within five business days as a recording. It's on our website. We'll also get it out to the schools, the panelists who are with us. So if anybody couldn't catch it all or needs to sign off early, that will be available at lsac.org. Dean Jenkins, uh, any closing thoughts you have for our, our, uh, our viewers today? about uh, navigating this crisis and, and navigating the admissions process itself? Well, look, my advice is, is this. It's about perseverance um, and in this time of, of challenge. And, and we need and we hope and we want students to persevere in their journey uh, towards a legal education. I think that it's really critically and important um, and, and that ultimately, um, you know, we have, we're creating all kinds of tools to help students. Uh, that's what uh, the process is. And, and when I talk about holistic admissions, I know, you know, with, with these, with, with all the experts uh, in, in, um, on the panel, um, I think it's true that it's about, we're looking to invite students in. We're looking to bring students into um, not only our law schools, but ultimately our profession. Uh, to do really important work, and uh, and I'm just so grateful that we have the LSAC as our partner uh, in that. And and you know, one of the great things is the LSAT has been around for a very long time. Um, we use it not to screen people out, but we use it because it's an effective piece of information as part of a whole picture. And we have every confidence that the LSAT Flex will be just as valuable. Um, and, and I think it's a great example of perseverance and creativity and flexibility that we hope our students will exhibit 
that, that we're trying to exhibit in, in our field um, and in partnership with LSAC to keep um, uh, the justice pipeline um, uh, flowing uh, because uh, like I said, we need it now more than ever. So thank you and good luck and for, forge ahead. <laughs> Good advice. Forge ahead. Alicia, well, let me turn to you for any closing thoughts you have for our, our viewers today. I just really want to encourage, especially the applicants that are wanting to start in fall of 20. Um, I know there will be some things that we have to overcome, you know, down the road, but I really would really encourage, especially the fall of 20 applicants to not to give up, to forge ahead. Um, you know, the, the flex is there to help you make your you know, dream come true and not miss a beat. Um, so you can make it, it's not gonna put you at a disadvantage to be this May uh, test taker. So please don't let that deter you from, um, from applying to a school that you know, you're interested in. And you know, don't let it discourage you that you might have to make a decision unlike you've made it before. You know, a lot of applicants come to the uh, admitted student event and they see the facilities and they talk to the people. But I think all of us are working very diligently to make that as much of um, a reality in a different form um, than we possibly can. And so I would really hate to see students decide not to come in the fall because they couldn't get to a campus because I think you can get to know the school very well um, if you reach out, like uh, Katrin mentioned, you talk to people. Um, I know all of us have things and events and um, things designed to help introduce you to our schools and our communities and and we want you to take advantage of those because we don't want anybody um, having to put their dream on hold um, because they couldn't get to a campus because I think you can be just as diligent in your process in your research and make a good decision even if you can't get to the school. That's great advice you you sure can you could talk to alumni and current students all kinds of things good good. Katrin, I want to turn to you for any closing comments. Absolutely. I mean, I think that this situation uh, is hard for everyone. And I think that students, one thing that maybe has been a benefit of the situation is that it has slowed everyone down a little bit and to some extent. So it also has allowed students to view how schools react under the circumstances to go to bat for their students. So I think that this has actually presented a, an opportunity to see how the dean of a law school, like for example at Miami Law, has been able to push initiatives forward to help our students in terms of mindfulness and wellness and how our faculty has been able to change the grading policy to help students, how you know the dean has gone to bat uh, with the uh, bar examiners to support our three L's. So I think that this is also an opportunity for students to evaluate each of the school's way that they support students and truly see whether it is a good fit for them. I don't think that you get this type of action usually in the, in, in the summer. So um, I think that in addition to being proactive, um, we are all doing our best to support our students and it's a great way to evaluate whether it's the right fit for you. Um, reach out. I hope that if you're interested in, you know, any of the schools that you're interested in, reach out. We're here to help you navigate the process. Call us. We're home. So what else do we have to do, right? We have to talk to you and we want to talk to you. So we want to make sure that um, I can't emphasize that enough. And I think that as personally, I'm a first generation uh, student. I think first generation students have a tendency to maybe not ask for help as much as others. And I, I you know, I speak for myself as well. So reach out. We're here to help. The administration wants to help, whether you're a current student, a prospective student, somebody who's wanting to take the LSAT or wants to apply next year. Um, so please, uh, I, I can't stress it enough. Advocate for yourself. And if you want to go to law school, let us help you make that dream happen. Katrin, thanks for sharing that. I, I join you in being a first gen uh, in my family too. And uh, I think it's Sometimes it, you know, when you don't know the legal profession, it might seem a little alienating, but I certainly know that uh, it's so welcoming. People want you to join the legal profession and we all want you to, to help. We need your voices. So I uh, couldn't agree with you more that that, uh, that hand is outstretched and, and uh, wanting to pull people in. Matthew, uh, closing comments from, from you, my friend. Oh, well, you know, everything has, 
pretty much been said, you know, from my colleagues, but uh, I, I guess I would just say to the applicants is that, uh, you know, don't lose sight of the end goal. And don't lose sight, you know, that at the end of the day, all of us are looking to uh, encourage you to uh, enter this wonderful profession. And we're not looking to create barriers. In fact, we're looking to, you know, ease the number of barriers that students, you know, can go from the applicant into a law student and to become a lawyer. And, you know, as everyone has said so far, just you know, continue uh, to reach out to schools, reach out to LSAC, because we're all in this together. We're really trying to make it as easy as possible. And at the end of the day, you know, schools want you, right? You know, we're looking to fill our classes with the best and the talented students, and you are it. And so, you know, um, just do not hesitate at all to reach out. Thank you, Matthew. And it's such a good reminder too that, you know, we are blessed in the United States with so many wonderful law schools and the students, the candidates will find the right fit for them. And there's more than one right fit. And so, you know, as you pursue this journey, just know that you have a, a real wealth of resources out there and everyone's interest is aligned with wanting to build this profession and make this profession strong. We need it to combat inequalities. We need it to build a world where everyone can thrive and we want you to be a part of it. So just as each of the panelists has said, uh, we're all here together for you. And we're really pleased that we've been able to bring you the LSAT Flex so that your journey can continue without any delay. And that's something that uh, we will work with you on uh, as noted by, I think, Alicia, any change is a change. Uh, being accustomed to change is critical skill for lawyers too. And we will help you navigate this so that you can continue your enrollment journey. I wanna remind you just of a couple things, and that is that we do have a Q&A, a top 10 questions on our website. We have many more details there too about things like, what can I have on my desk when I'm taking the test? And you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what are the steps to sign up for it? And, and how do I proceed if I wanna test in June? So please be in touch with us and we'll make sure we take care of you as you go through that process. I also wanna let you know again that this has been recorded. So if anyone missed earlier parts, that recording will be available at lsac.org within five business days. So please feel free to uh, consult that or let friends you know who may need this information, pass it on, let them know. Um, I also wanna just close by saying that um, we uh, continue to want to make sure that those of you wanting to pursue JD education are ready to take the LSAT flex and can pursue that. I also want to say that many of you might be thinking about an LLM or you might be thinking about a master's degree. And so whatever kind of legal education you're looking for, know that we're here to help you and the schools are here to help you. And together we can all build a legal profession that's worthy of the promise of equal justice that we all seek. So thank you for being with us today. And I wanna give great thanks to our panel. Let's give them a big round of applause. They're busy people and they took time to help us, uh, us learn and, uh, and share information with candidates. And we will do these candidate webinars routinely. So please check back for future webinars and thanks for joining us today.